My boy, what's happening with you, bro? Good yeah, to see you, dog. What's up, dog? Good? On, Looking good always, bro. Always fashion. Love it, love it. Big, how that game coming along? Yeah? Calculate your handicap? Yeah, I'm like a 14 right now. I'll take that. <laughs> the crazy thing is, like, the receivers, always the kickers and punters, Yeah. they get the single digit, but low single digit. The kickers are always so freaking good, Yo, but man. how many times we used to be leaving Fast Friday or something, <laughs> and then they, they in golf clothes, they, and I'm like, oh, y'all got energy they already to do back. anything outside of football right now. How long have you been playing, Frazy? Man, I've been playing too long, but, but, <laughs> but not consistent. <laughs> yeah, that's the That's where it comes to. I am bagger man. Fred play with bagger man. <laughs> Big ass, thick, swollen, too. But no, it, it comes down to that. You know, like, what we do for our careers, mm -hmm. Like it's, it becomes second nature. We yeah. don't we don't flinch. We don't think yep. twice. That third and ten you caught against the Jets, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. took it for ninety nine. You wouldn't think you just yeah, pop on. Just go. I'm yeah, out of here. Yeah, just go. Shit, go like that. Yeah. Golf and football it's is tough. two totally it's different tough. things. Yeah, yeah, you talk about it, right. my 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 mental stability at this age is not <laughs> is not in the place I needed to and be. And that's the big key to it too. Is like <laughs> even if you're playing well or you start off bad, you gotta still stay. Even kill, because the minute you get crazy, oh, the whole round is done. Every shot is done. You can't yeah. operate like that. That's a rich man's game. I'm, still, <laughs> I'm just trying to work my way. It's my a way up to it. Drink is for to me. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm a happy yeah, day guy. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach guy, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Get my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach guy, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Welcome to The Pivot, Victor Cruz. So to many people, you need no introduction, but a huge reason that you are here is the meteoric rise from an undrafted free agent to a pro bowler, Super Bowl champion, uh, now a megastar post-career. Welcome to The Pivot, it's Freddie T. That's Chan, I'm RC. Thank you to all the people that have supported us. We appreciate you guys. Continue to support. We'll continue to try to give you dope content. To DraftKings, our sponsor. To Happy Dad, our partner. We thank you for your support as well. Let's continue to make this thing go. Vic, man, first of all, thank you for giving us some time. Uh, we know that you're busy. You know, when you're a fashion icon, <laughs> when you're a media star, and now trying to become a scratch golfer, uh -huh. Driving around in the Beamer commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm I love that, that second <laughs> yeah, series. Thank you, man. Well, yeah. You know, uh, it, it's a lot to do, so to get this time is, is cool for us. But I do want to start kind of early because everything about you when you first hit the scene was talking about the origin story, where this guy comes from, that when you see six catches, 145 yards, three tubs in the preseason, how do they miss on this wide receiver? from UMass, but it starts in Patterson, New Jersey, close relationship with your mother, uh, learning how to budget your money and go to banks and those things. What parts of your upbringing allowed you to become the success that you are? Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. I think it was, uh, it was just bits and pieces of everything, man. I think it was seeing my mother drive an hour to work to and from and seeing that grind and what, what she had to go through just to put food on the table. You know, you know, having to walk to school and, and walk by things that you had to kind of, you know, make sure you don't get involved in both to and from, you know what I mean? So it was just all these little things, all these little, um, you know, pointers and all these mentors and coaches and people that I had in my life that really aided me in my development and really helped me become the person I am today. Because we all know those high school years are very formative, you know, they're very influential. Those moments that I remember are so vivid from every year of high school. Um, and to have those coaches, to have my mom, to have those people around me, my dad as well at the time, to have those people around me was really, really special and important. And it just shaped me. It helped me to build that resilience. It helped me never to quit. I didn't know what that was. My mom's only motto was like, you never want to be a quitter. You never want to be known as someone that started something and quit for whatever reason. And those things showed up all throughout my life. Prep school, guys were getting kicked out left and right. And I just finished through. I didn't, it, I hated it, didn't love it. It was in Maine by myself, didn't have no family, didn't know anybody. Closest thing to us was a post office. So like, I knew that I had to just finish. Like, all I got is football and class up here. And I'm putting my best into it, put my all into it and see where we net up. 
Why'd you go to prep school? Why'd you have to go that route? Cause that damn SAT, man. I don't know who, uh, can we end this? Who, who, this is me? Yeah. <laughs> we need to dead this SAT, man. We need to find a different way. Cause kids aren't, you know, I just used to get flustered taking this test four hours. I took that thing seven times, mm. seven times. And then I think eight to finally get over the hump in prep school. So I had good grades, but you knew back then it was the clearinghouse. You had to have a certain GPA with a certain SAT score. So I just couldn't get that score. And um, so that's why I had to go to prep school, just so I could have a couple more cracks at taking the SAT. Nowadays, it's much easier, though, because they strategically tell you what to answer, what not to answer. Okay. You know, we like to say, based on the money these guys are getting, we were born too soon. <laughs> yeah, we were. <laughs> but maybe they should have had that strategy back then when you were coming out. Yeah, for sure. I think you would have seen just a lot more guys being able to go to that next level. Think about how many guys fell to the wayside that were good athletes, good players, that just couldn't cross over that hump and then end up being back home, you know, either falling to the wayside in the streets where I was from or turning into coaches and making it advantageous for themselves. But they could have really reached the maximum level of their potential if they would have had that opportunity. Did you did you hoop coming up? Because you're in Jersey. Like, yeah, I'm more of basketball than football. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I was hooping first. So I, I, I didn't play football. I mean, I played Little League and things like that. But when I got to high school, I was like, oh, I'm a basketball player. Like. And then it got to my sophomore year. I'll never forget this thing. It was sophomore year. And it was a community, right? We, everybody knew the high school coaches from Little League. You just saw them all around. You knew who they were. So I'm in high school, sophomore year. And my, um, my high school football coach walks into the gym. And we on the layup lines. It's the beginning of practice. And he goes, yo, you know they give out double the amount of scholarships in football than they do basketball, right? And I kind of looked in the mirror. I was like, about 5'11". <laughs> yeah, let me get this football thing another <laughs> shot. Let me see what's going on. And then... And then that's when I went back into football junior year and then played junior senior year and then, you know, got the opportunity to go to UMass. We're talking about test taking. Yeah. Because if you read, I say Wikipedia says it, you struggled to balance school and sports. But you hear you talk, you know, from afar and now sitting there with you, articulate, intelligent dude. But the narrative is that you couldn't play ball and study at the same time. Why do you think that narrative is out there about you? Well, I think it was because my college years weren't great. You know, I was, uh, the, you know, I got kicked out of UMass the first two years I was there, mainly because I was on some blue chip shit. Like, I was just like, oh, y'all got me in here to play ball. Y'all gonna pass me and figure this out. And also, growing up with my moms, particularly, you know, her flipping the light on, waking you up every day, and then all of a sudden she ain't there flicking the light on. You're like, well, I can get a couple extra of these then. I don't really gotta go to that class, you know? So I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I took it for granted in the beginning, and I just... I thought when you get to this level, it was just, you know, it was automatic for you to be on the field and automatic for you to just be slid through the system. And I found out very quickly going to a, a community college back in Patterson and everybody looking at me like, bro, what you doing here? <laughs> you know, and, and that humbled me quick, real quick. You know, you speak of being humbled, you know, they were both, both guys were drafted. I was an undrafted guy. And there's a certain mindset you have to have to make a team. You have to feel like, in your mind, every time you step on the field, you're supposed to be there. But you also have to know that nobody around actually sees you the way you do, so you have to go out and prove it. How did the formative years of high school, having to walk by those things and pass by them, or having to go to prep school, only having school and football, and then the struggles at UMass early, being in the community college, how did those things prepare you for the grind of being an undrafted free agent? Well, it taught me exactly that, the grind, right? And it was forced upon me. So all the times I got kicked out, I had to like grind to get back. So I had to, you know, the first time I got kicked out of UMass, I was driving with my mom an hour to a community college first. So every morning, whether I had school or not, I would have to get in the car with my mom, drive her to school, to work, and then drive to community college, spend the day there, whether I had class or not, studying all day, eating, whatever. Then when I was done, get back in the car, pick mom up from work and drive all the way home. So every five days a week, I knew what that grind was. But, but even then, I wasn't like, man, this is crazy. I'm doing too much. It was just like, it is what it is. Like, I, this has to be done in order for me to get back on the same trajectory that I want to be on. I have to do this. So I did that and then went back, still behind the eight ball, got kicked out again. That's when my mother was like, you're going to Patterson. You're not, gonna, right. you're not coming up here with me no more. Uh, <laughs> so I would go to Patterson again. I would walk downtown, go to class all day, be around all my peers, that saw me play football and saw me go to college and be like, well, what are you doing back here? So that was a very humbling moment for me because I, 
I couldn't lie to them. You know, I couldn't make things up because I'm here physically right. looking you at y'all. Yeah, you see me here. So something ain't go right, obviously. So I had to be honest with them. And then, you know, luckily they were, they were more encouraging than they were ridiculing back then. And I was fortunate for that because that could have really just set me back during those years. But they were like, yo, just keep going. We got you. Keep moving forward. And then, um, and then that really helped me continue to stay on the path. And all of that culminated to when I got to the NFL, I was like, man, I ain't got nothing precious no more. I ain't got to go to class. I ain't got to walk nowhere. I ain't got to do nothing. Now I could really just hone in and just play every day like it was my last. And, and, I, think, uh, and I think it paid off, especially that, that rookie season. That sounded like to me, bro. He was a mama's boy. <laughs> like, all your stories come back to mom. Still like, am. Am. Like, still what, 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 would it have helped you to get out of your bubble? Because like you're saying, you're an hour here. You're Jersey, you're an hour here. You're back right back in Jersey. Mm-hmm. And then coincidentally get drafted to the Giants right here. But you don't think it would help you to get out of that bubble, go to Tennessee, go to Georgia somewhere, and have to be your own damn yeah. man? Um, maybe. I mean, I, I think, you know, UMass was three and a half hours away, so it was just far enough. I mean, Maine for that year, it was eight hours or more, like 10 hours away. So I, got, I had my shares of being away, um, but, but my problem wasn't being away it, it, or being close to home. My problem was staying focused enough to understand what you needed to do at this level to make it, to continue to succeed and advance yourself in your career. I think that was my issue and understanding the level of focus that that took. Was uh, it just took me a little later in my in my in my years than it did in the beginning. Vic, you just spoke about your childhood. And a lot of guys like to say, my and my dream was to make it to the NFL. I never had that dream. And you you speak about getting in and out of college. You know, there had to be something that sustained you. Yeah. Did you ever uh, have the dream of making it to the NFL, or when did that? You know, come into play. I definitely had the dream of making it to the ne- to the next level to the NFL, and I knew all I wanted was a shot, but I knew. In order for me to get that shot, I had to be on the football field. I had to be here. I had to be present. I had to, you know, figure it out. So nothing ever deterred me from that goal. Like, that was my dream, and I knew that, you know, I could do it. I remember uh, me and a friend of mine, a teammate, he was like a year younger than I was, and uh, we would always do our NFL trot at UMass. Like, we, you know, when you see guys in slow-mo yeah. on ESPN walking, <laughs> they got their helmet. So we would always just, just little things like that, already envisioning ourselves at the next level, you know what I mean? And I was fortunate enough, and it helped me a ton. We had a guy by the name of Vladimir Dukas, who was an offensive lineman, who was supposed to go top, you know, he was a top, a highly touted draft pick. I think he was second round. So we had scouts all over, uh, all the time. So it, I would see one of them walking out to practice or walking into the meeting room, and, I, and I'm like, oh, it's go time. These, those were my games, you know, in practice. So just taking advantage of all those opportunities, man, and, and, um, and just understanding that the goal was always the NFL, because because mama ain't had no money and I had to figure And then, you know, when my dad and my grandfather passed away, I was the man of the house. I, it was nobody else that was gonna take care of everybody but me. And, uh, and I had to, had to figure it out. You know, you talk about nobody to take care of home, but you, you obviously have the, the huge preseason game against the Jets where everybody realizes, oh crap, like, like this kid can go. And then you now put yourself in those conversations, but the rookie year doesn't really go how you want it to. You know, you get injured and now, you don't come back and have the preseason like the year before. And so you're going through all these things, fighting and fighting and fighting. And I think it was what, like Dominic Hickson or somebody gets injured and then you, and then you get your chance and you explode once again, become this big time player after everything you had gone through. And now being in New York, being a hometown kid, having this success, playing at a Pro Bowl level, how did you deal with now this sudden fame for a young man who wasn't expected to be what he was. It was tough in the beginning because you're pulled in nine different places. Coach Coughlin used to call it, you got another rubber chicken circuit tonight, huh? Like another <laughs> gala, another yeah. event to go to. And, um, and, and it was a little bit of a struggle in the beginning, but luckily for me, I had grown up here. So I grew up going back and forth to New York City as a kid, as a teen. I grew up going back and forth and parties and just doing different things in New York and understanding it and, and being around it for a long time so that it didn't really like affect me the way it might affect other players because I kind of knew how to navigate it a little bit. It's different having a little bit more money in my pocket and moving around in different circles, but it's still the same thing in a sense. So it was just good to have that in my back pocket as something I could go back to and be like, oh, I'm, I've, I've navigated these streets. I know half of these people right. in a lot of these circles. So it was easier for me to navigate. But man, in the beginning, just being pulled and prodded and just being pulled in this direction, can't say no to that. 
another opportunity with, you know, money in the balance and things that you want to accomplish and do for your family. Like, you know, it was tough. It was tough to kind of keep it all in bounds and still focus on football. And I've actually seen it on TV. People do this to you. When did you get tired of saucing? Because I've actually watched the dude be like, Victor, go! <laughs> and your black ass said. <laughs> You start dance. dancing, Chad? Dance! Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, it's, it's true, man. I mean, I'm not tired of it yet, because every time I dance, it's like another check. I can hear the check going into the account. So it's, so it's cool. Hear the cha-ching. Yeah, I can hear the, the jack the money falling in. But it was, you know, it's a testament to my grandmother, and it's a testament to my culture and who I am. So anytime, you know, now I just, I just make sure I'm not the guy that's just like, hey, let's just see the dance. I'm gonna make you dance with me. Like, I'm gonna make, if you wanna see it, I wanna see you do it too. And I'm gonna dance with you. Like, so I'm gonna always bring it inclusive and bring people inside of it with me because that's just the way I wanted it to be. That's what it was intended to be, was something that brings people together and it brought cultures together and got people, uh, you know, of Spanish descent watching football that never watched yeah. before. Like my grandmother, and God bless her dad, but when she was, uh, when I did it, she was still alive and she called me right after the game, like, what was that? I was like, well, it was a little salsa for you, uh, uh, Wella. And she was like, yo, that was dope. No matter no matter how many years you play in this league, I want you to do that for the rest oh, of your career. Oh, man. And, the dance, and became, I was like, Duh. the dance became iconic. Yeah. The other guy that's real popular has a popular Carlton. Mm -hmm. But it's in, the same, <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the same league, though. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I just want to Did you just from, compare the salsa? No, no, I didn't. Carlton I'm talking from about the Fresh Prince? How iconic the dance is. <laughs> I'll take because, it. I'll take <laughs> it. For real. Because I'm sure you see the fans like Channing said. They say, like, they just fans, start like, dancing. you know, yeah, cut yeah, one 100%. with me. And the same thing with Carlton. He's like, I'm not dancing. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's a popular thing. Yeah. But uh, going back to what RC was mentioning about coming out rookie year, not so great. And then the next year, you put up big numbers, I think well over 1,500 yards. Uh, but you didn't make the Pro Bowl. You know, I've, I've been there before. You know, what, what was your mindset, you know, back then? And do you remember the Pro Bowl roster? Because the years I didn't make it, I remember the guys that they chose before. <laughs> um, that year, no. I, I wasn't too upset about it because I knew I kind of, I wasn't even on any of the ballots. Like, I was undrafted. No one even expected. It, it was crazy. But, but luckily, that year, we were fortunate enough to be in contention to go to the Super Bowl. Right. So I was still like, you know what? If we make the Super Bowl, I could care less about the Pro Bowl that year. You know, I want to be... I want to hoist that trophy at the end of the year if we got the chance to, you know what I'm saying? So that was that became more important as we continued to win and our journey started to lead towards the playoffs and, and so on. So I was more so like, all right, if the Pro Bowl don't happen, that's cool. They know I should be in there. I don't have to go on a petition and do all of that stuff. But am I, if I got an opportunity to win the Super Bowl, then let's go. If you're going to petition the SAT, we got to petition the Pro Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, it ain't even the Pro Bowl. No way. They're playing right, right. two in touch, man. Like, I don't right, know it what matter. it is. You mentioned, and you kind of led me to where I want to go, the pinnacle of what we do is the Super Bowl. And the media capital of the world is New York. And to be a kid that, that grows up here and gets to play for the hometown team, I couldn't imagine that sort of feeling. And to reach that goal, to actually host the Sticky Lombardi after the Super Bowl, what did that moment mean to you? And what has had to be some sort of surreal, full circle memory for you? Man, it brought it all together, uh, yeah. to be honest. Like all the stories of me, you know, an hour with moms, you know, being in Maine, not knowing nobody, not seeing nothing, and then, and then getting kicked out twice out of UMass, finally making the league. You splash on the scene, but still got to fight the next year to make the team. Like, it just brought it all together, man. And it really just culminated. And it's just the biggest, i never forget after the game, after the Super Bowl, I'm like leaning on my mother and I'm just exhausted. And I was like, mom, we did it. Like, we did it, man. Like, after all of that, she was like, I know. <laughs> she just like, I'm like, I know, bro. I had a headache for a long time, but you did it. You know, and it was just the biggest sigh of relief to finally do that, not only for myself, but for kids in Patterson for people that, for undrafted guys like us to, to, to see that you can make it to this thing, man, if you work hard enough. And, and, and just for everybody that looked at my story and was inspired by it, there was actually a peak. There was actually, you know, the confetti came down on me. And that was, uh, and that's a moment that I'll never forget that they can never take from me. And you know, in this league, all you guys know, you want moments and things that they can't take from yes. you. Yes. Because they're gonna try they're gonna and take, take it all. <laughs> they're gonna take everything else. 
I didn't think y'all could win that game. Okay. Y'all was like, y'all weren't preseason. Nobody thought y'all was going that far. When did you know? Like, when did y'all really know in the locker room? Because some people be lying. Oh, he knew in camp. No, y'all was sorry as hell. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> no, that's true. We went through a skip. We lost like four straight in the middle yeah. of that season. And um, but it's funny because we knew, you know, sometimes in the in the locker room, you just know you got the talent. You're just waiting for the right time. Or you're just waiting for the, everything to kind of click. We had the right balance of veterans and young players that can contribute. And we knew that if we just stayed healthy and we just kind of figured out and we hit our stride, and I think that's when we hit our stride. It was when Brandon Jacobs got healthy, Antro Rowe got healthy, and he kind of yeah. called out Justin Tuck. He kind of called out everybody in the locker room. And uh, Justin Tuck was kind of one of those guys that was in between. He came out and practiced, and, and that's what really culminated and brought our team together. And, uh, and that's when we just hit our stride, man. And, and you could feel everyone knew their roles. Everyone knew exactly what was asked of everyone. And when their number was called to perform, they just came through. You know, for undrafted free agents, they are, there are different moments. And there's moments where you have these team achievements, but also I feel like individual accomplishments mean a ton to you because you didn't get that number called. You didn't get that phone call on draft day to say that you are worth it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the moment that tells us that is our first contract, our first opportunity to negotiate a deal. Like I remember I played well in Washington. I played with Sean Taylor. People thought we were going to play together for a long time. God rest his soul. And that's what we wanted. And I was willing. They say, they signed Adam Archuleta, bro. And I was like, if you just give me a good contract, I'll come back. I'll compete. I'll play. I want to be here. I end up going to Pittsburgh. And I remember driving away in the car from Pittsburgh after they negotiated my deal. And I just cried in the back of the car. And it wasn't because I now felt like I had a certain amount of money. It was because I finally felt, at least in this stage of my life, somebody wanted me, right? Somebody actually valued me. For you, you got an opportunity because of your play. You earned it, and you know you had to earn it. You got an opportunity to sign a big contract and give yourself an amount of money to take care of your people, as you mentioned, being the man of the house. What was that moment like for you, understanding that all the hard work, at least individually now, is being rewarded and valued? That was one of the best moments of my life. I mean, it literally changed my life. It changed the trajectory of where my life would, would go. Uh, because once an organization like the Giants wraps their arm around you and gives you that contract and believes in you, it's one of those things that if you do your part, you'll be here forever. Like, you'll be in the pantheon of Giants greats forever. And, and they'll always treat you as such, and we always have those conversations, and you'll always be in the fold. And, things that they do and anniversaries and you guys know all of that stuff. So you're just always be in that fold. And that's a legacy that I want to leave to my daughter, who she loves being at these Giants games, running <laughs> around like, man, I can't even, just the thought of her running around there is just hilarious to me because she's just so comfortable and the organization has brought her in. And like, that's what I wanted, you know, that's, that's exactly what I wanted. But I knew it had to start with the hard work to get to that point to be someone that they can rely on and trust with money like that. Because it's not just, hey, here's the money, now you're good. Yeah. It's like, we need to be able to trust that you're going to be an outstanding citizen in the community. You represent us now every time you walk around, every red carpet, every camera that's in your face, you're representing this organization. So we need to be able to trust you with this amount of money and trust that you're not only going to be a good person on the field, but a good and smart one off it as well. Kennedy, you know, your daughter, for, for us, we are all fathers and you know, we have daughters and it's just different. You know what I mean? Like the way I treat my son is different than I treat my girls. Like I, I'm not really concerned with you, bro. Like <laughs> sometimes you're gonna have to get it out the mud on your own. But for those girls, there's such a different feeling in getting your opportunity to look into their eyes and say, I'm, I'm, the, I'm your man forever, mm -hmm. right? No matter what decisions you make, who you marry, if you need me, I'm going to be there having such a close relationship with your mother and now getting to be a parent yourself, what has that relationship meant for you to be Kennedy's father? It's, uh, you know, aside from winning the bowl and, and all of this, the best feeling in the world to know that you're so influential in this little girl's life, you know, that everything that she does is circled around you. She wants to make you happy. She wants to put a smile on your face and vice versa. So it's just always, always important for me to show her the right way and just show her the right things to do and kind of lead her in the, in, in the right path because uh, that's what I would want, you know, if, that was, if the shoe was on the other foot. So I think it's just dope. My mother had me at 25 and I had my daughter at 25. 
So it's kind of dope to kind of have, to see where my mom was at the same age where my daughter was growing up and to have questions from my mom and her to know because she was in the same age and state that I was in. So I just love having that balance that we can have with one another. And with every day that matures and every day that passes that Kennedy gets older and older, I just try to cherish it, man, because they're going fast. She's 11 now, dog, and it's just like, where did it go? <laughs> right. I had her the same year I won the Super Bowl. I called mm -hmm. her my good luck charm. I had her a month before we won. So it was just like, she came during the best year of my life. So she'll always have that special that special place in my heart, you know? In the Giants organization, you were just briefly mentioning about that. Plex talks highly about the organization, obviously, but more so about the Mara family. Uh, how influential have they been in your life uh, while you were playing and post-career? Uh, definitely while I was playing, um, they would always just be in conversation with me or just talking about the game or just they saw me as someone that's understanding of this football team and always wanted my input. And, and that's something I respected. That's something I always, because they didn't have to do that. You know, they didn't, have, they didn't need my input. They've been running this team for years. You know, Wellington before John, obviously. So they understand how to run a business here. But for them to consult with me from time to time about things that are going on within the team, that was always great. And even when they let me go, I never forget going to see, uh, you know, Mr. Mara right after. He was like, man, this is one of the hardest decisions I've had to make. Uh, letting you go from this football team, but you know, I promise you, your name will be in the ring of honor one day. Mm. And when he said that to me, I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. In my head, I was like, oh shit. But in my mouth, I was like, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Like, so, you know, they just, that organization and the Mara family has just, just done so much for my career and my life um, that I will always, you know, show love and support to them as a family and the Tisch family as well. They, they've, both families have done so much for my career. Football is about the high moments, and that's what the, the world sees. You mentioned one of the lows is being cut, and some of us get to walk away on our own. Some of us don't. Most of us don't. It was actually my 35th birthday, October 12th, 2014. You're playing against Philadelphia, and this is kind of what may have started you going to that point. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you injure your knee. You know, you're, you're carted off and, and you're crying. And you are understanding the gravity of what just happened on the field. Take us back to that moment and your mindset after suffering that injury. And that was a toughie because, uh, you know, I was here. I was on the trajectory, right? Just won the bowl, just pro bowl, it's third year after that. So I'm just like, we're going here. And I started off the year great. Had a touchdown against, uh, who was it, Atlanta, whoever we played before that. Like, just playing well. You know, I break that seven cut to the corner, and nobody touched me. And I just went to jump, and I heard it. And I was like, oh, that's not good. And um, I had never felt anything like that in my life, within my body, within anything. And immediately collapsed to the ground. And first thought was, what the hell just happened? You know what I mean? Second thought was, this could be it. Like, you just, you know, I've seen it. You've seen the injuries happen. You've seen different people go. You, you've just seen it all. So I'm like, this, this could be it, man. Like, this is one of those injuries in my knee, too. You just start going through all the things. And, um, and one of the trainers, as soon as they came up to me, he was one of the trainers I was friendly with all the time. He goes, did you, you heard it pop. Did, like, he knew immediately. Mm. And I was like, yeah, I did. And, um, and immediately when they put me up on the cart and I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I'm just brought to tears. Because A, I knew the rest of the season was done, obviously. I wasn't playing. And then B, just the uncertainty. I just don't know how I'm gonna heal from this. I don't know what that looks like. I don't even know what the injury is exactly. So just processing all of that just had me uh, just everywhere. And I was distraught. I was in the back yelling, crying. Somebody tell me I'm gonna be all right. It's so, like nobody telling me nothing. Everybody right. just talking within themselves. So I could tell it's serious, but like somebody talk to me. Like, Somebody tell me something, console me right now. You know what I'm saying? I'm the one hurt. Like, I'm the one hurt. Like, I get it. Like, y'all talking, trying to figure this out, but somebody come holler at me. Right. Uh, so that was, that was, you know, that's, I was just all over the place. And then finally got me to the hospital. I spent the night in Philly. And it was dope because the coach came over, uh, Philly's coach at the time, coached over at, U at University of New Hampshire, too. So he knew me um, from the college years as well. So he came to the, uh, he came to the hospital and was like, man, we just want to, send our love to you and show us, show you that we're here in your corner, man. You're a UMass guy. We've, 
I've seen you for years. This is nothing for you. You'll get through this. And I was like half on drugs, like, thank coach. Like, <laughs> but it was just, it was just love for him to just show that love and to come. He didn't have to do that. You know, he could have sent a letter or sent a, you know, a video or something, but he showed up. And uh, and that was Chip Kelly, actually. I was called Chip Kelly. So that was that was just incredible uh, to have that love from him and to have that love from the opposing team too. Did you ever feel the same? Because we look at the numbers and it seemed like it went downhill from there. Like, and everybody talks about Adrian Peterson, because I told my ACL four times. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to bring up Adrian Peterson. I tell him that is an alien. Yeah. That's not the same. <laughs> Can you kind of take us through the recovery? And then did you ever feel the same? Did you ever feel like you were the, the Victor Cruz that was going to Pro Bowl? So uh, after the first injury um, and I came back from that, I did feel the same. I mm. felt great. I was feeling good. I was in training camp. I was making the cuts I was making. And then I had the calf injury on the other side. Yeah. And then that's when I was like, OK, this is, this is different. This is because that's like a blown tire almost. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? If you want to compare it to a car, like that's like blowing a tire. So I had to recover from that. So I missed the following year. And then once I recovered from that, I just knew I wasn't the same. I, I, I knew I still had some ability. I could still do some things. I could still situationally get, get to it. But in the long haul, I knew that there was, there was a drop off there. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, and it hurt. I mean, you just, you know, as an athlete now, I'm trying to find, you know, you're trying to find different ways to affect the game with your voice or with knowledge in the meeting rooms or when you get your opportunities, you make the best of them. Like one play every game that year where I would just have like a little splash play mm -hmm. or like a 50 yard catch or like, so I would impact the game in spurts, but I knew that I wasn't the same guy. I knew that, you know, two surgeries later to, that I wasn't going to be the same, the same athlete, but I just wanted to continue to put my best foot forward and, and, and see, see where I net out. Because again, my man raised no quitter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I had to follow through. It's funny how uh, God works. A lot of time I like to say he's a comedian because mm -hmm. th things just happen. But the irony in, in your injury, 2014, right? That was Odell's uh, rookie year. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned take advantage of your opportunity. Exactly. And he certainly grasped it and, and, and took full advantage of it. But going back to the second injury, do you think it, that happened because of overcompensating for your knee on the opposite side? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think just being on my left leg and just, you know, being in a straight leg cast for so long and depending on the opposite leg. And, and then when you're working out, you're not thinking about what it's affecting because you're just walking, you're just doing your normal day to day things. You're not thinking about how much stress you're actually putting on the opposite leg throughout the recovery process of the other one. So I think, yeah, I think it was just like that fatigue setting on the left side after recovering from the right side and being able to run again, um, but trying to make those same cuts, my leg was too fatigued and was like, over, you know, that's when the calf just went because it was that overcompensation over months and months of time yep. just really deteriorated and that's when the calf just couldn't go anymore. And back to Odell uh, in that rookie year and how well he performed. Uh, after your injury, how much time did you guys get to spend together where you're the vet and you're in his ear just teaching and continue to teach him and show him how to maneuver around the game? It was a ton, and a lot of it wasn't necessarily on the field. Uh, little nuancy things like that, but he pretty much had, you know, he was a naturally gifted athlete. Most of it was off the field. Most of it was like how to navigate New York City, right. how to navigate this area, how to understand this city. They're going to love you when you're up, and when you're down, they're going to bash you. Understand that. Don't feed into that as much as you can, um, because, you know, when you're up is when they're going to love you the most. And even when you're down, when they see you, they're going to love you. But, mm. but just understand that it comes, it, all of that comes with this in New York City. This ain't Jacksonville or this ain't Tennessee. You know what I mean? But yes, but yes. But yes. But yes. But yes. You straight you know, to Jville right. too. Hey, that's the truth. Yeah, but <laughs> it's real, you know, it's real. So yeah. it was just a lot of that. And then I would go to his career. We would spend time outside of the game too, just chilling and hanging out as well. So it was, it was, a, it was fortunate for me to be around him throughout those those early years, and hopefully he took something from me. Hopefully he learned a lot He of probably that took that fashion swag yeah, from Yeah, me. he definitely got that. Boys. that. I ain't worried about Although I did want to cut his hair when he came in. I was like, bro, what's, what's this? We shaving this tomorrow. What we got going? It took him a couple of years, but he finally shaved right. it, so we good. Did you teach him how to navigate the women? <laughs> Because I know more about y'all body counts than I know about my damn oh, kids. Where the body count at? That ain't on, that ain't on the Wikipedia. Is it? <laughs> that ain't on the Wikipedia. Look, like, say, football got you that fame. Football yeah. made you famous. Let's yeah. be honest. I got you famous. That's why people know the name. Yep. How, how do you, if you do, how do you deal with it? Do you like the attention that every. I just saw something this morning. 
Victor Cruz sing with Mystery Woman on the beach. Like oh, yeah. every time. I was on the beach. That was me. Shut three up. Three weeks me. ago. Yeah, I, was, I think that was some little, <laughs> some, some little exotic young lady. I see lady. you doing a different Google search. Oh, yeah. I don't give a damn about no stats. I mean, he, I mean, he, he was in Bermuda. <laughs> yeah, you know. Oh, was, man. He's an exotic out there. But do you, do you like that? Because for, funny thing, I looked it up. I go back to thinking about talking about your daughter. She has a phone. She can look yeah. it up. Oh, she brought that same article up to me, too. Oh. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it comes with it. It's a gift and a curse, right? You understand it, but... Um, I just think if I don't let it get to me, if I, I, I never want to be in a position where I can't just live my life. You know what I mean? Like, I'm never going to let it affect me to the point where I can't live my life. Like, if y'all want to take pictures of me on the beach, cool. Let me get y'all the right, let me get y'all the right angle so y'all see exactly what's going on. Like, we're going to do it. You know? So, I, I don't mind that. I, I just, just don't defame me. Don't talk about my family. Don't try to come at my character. Don't do none of that. But if you want to get pictures on the beach with me, and the lovely lady that I'm with at the time? Sure. Why not? I'm cool with that. Well, speaking of lovely ladies, you had a very- I segued myself right yeah, into that. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. You had, a very, you had a relationship with Karuchi Tran, which becomes even more public. It's one thing if Victor Cruz is dating or on the beach with a mystery woman. It's different when that other person is also a public figure. You sat down with Wendy Williams, and at the time you said, I am ready to get married or I do feel a way to get married, also mentioning having your little football player, like having a son. When you think about going forward, and now you're not Vic, just Victor Cruz from Patterson, you're Victor Cruz that's trying to find a lifelong partner and create a family with someone else, knowing you're Victor Cruz. How hard is that to navigate, but how much do you still want those things? I definitely still want all those things. It's definitely hard as hell to navigate now, man, because you just don't know. You just don't know what these people's intentions are, especially nowadays. I mean, there's, I mean, you see stories all over the internet about different scenarios and different stories dealing with women and their narratives and their motives and things like that. So I just want to make sure that if I do choose someone, it's for the right reasons. It's because they're really here for me and really able to raise a family and to be around for the long haul and not just when things are great or when things are, you know, on the up and up. I need you to, I need to see you when it's dark outside and what does that look like? Now, I don't know how many dark days I got because ain't much been dark lately. It's been kind of fun. You know what I'm saying? So I need to just... How do those dark days transpire? What, how do those dark days come now? And how do, how do you navigate through those dark days that may look different? And how do you navigate through the happy days? Like, what does that look like for you? Are you someone that take, takes advantage? Mm. Or are you someone that just sits back and is appreciative of what's coming? And, like, it's just so many different levels to it that I just got to navigate, you know, each and every day. That's why I'm just trying to stay respectful of everyone, kind of be in my own space. I've always been... To be honest, I've always been in a relationship dude. Like high school years, I had someone. College, I had a girl for three years. I graduate, I get with my child's mother, who's phenomenal, but I do that. Like I never had time to really just be by myself and really just listen to what I want and really just be with my own thoughts and not you know, be next to someone for an extended period of time where that kind of gets muddled when you're next to someone. So I kind of wanted to have my own thoughts for a while and kind of see where that takes me. Was that kind of your mindset because when you date very publicly, you break up extremely publicly. And you know, now with social media, it's, it's all over the place. The, the relationship ends. How much more difficult is it to deal with something that is already, could already be painful, could already be difficult, but now you have to deal with it publicly. Like you walking around and people are like, oh yeah, you know, Vic and Karuchi, they broke up. I bet he can't watch Claws no more. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, like how, how difficult is it to be able to reset after something like that? Yeah, like I reset my cable and got the TNT off. Yeah. TNT, you know? <laughs> we're just going to stream it when the games come on, but we're not going to watch Claws. And then, nah, it's, um, it's a little different to navigate because obviously you see people, and let's be honest, there's some ignorant people out there that just say shit and just want to say things to you just to get under your skin and see how you react. But I handled it all with a smile, you know? I got, I remember I was doing a, um, you know, this is when COVID was still a thing. So I'm, we're doing Zoom meetings and Zoom. It was like a whole Zoom, like meet and greet is what it was. And they bring you through different rooms. And I get in one room and this dude was two inches on the game. was like, what happened with you and Karuchi? And I was like, 
Life happened, bro. Life happened. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I was just, and I just smiled. I said, life happened. He was like, okay, got it. And he just transitioned to the next topic. But those are the things that you got to deal with. Those are the things that come with the territory. But as long as, again, it ain't affecting my day to day. It ain't affecting the way I move about life. If I got to answer a few questions about why such and such, you know, her and I broke up. I can answer that all day because it's not. It wasn't anything malicious. It was just two people going in separate ways, going in separate directions in life. And one person feeling like they need to do that on their own, and one person feeling like they couldn't, and we go our separate ways. It's literally that simple. Still friends to this day, still have conversations from time to time. Like, you know, she just had something happen to her in her life. You know, she lost her dad, I lost my dad. You reach out. You're, we're human beings, bro. We're not like aliens that once we break up, oh my God, I gotta create this division. We're still human beings. She still needs someone that's been through something like that to reach out and say, hey, I'm here if you need somebody to talk to. Plain and simple. That's dope, bro. I just wanted to ask how you shoot. I want to go back to the beginning because the kid from, you know, that's jumping in from out of school, going to community colleges and things, and now you go shoot at Karuchi? But he ain't that kid no more, though. I just like, what, did the money change or what was you know, the case? So, so, you know, I try to be a little, you know, a little suave, a little bit, yeah. right? So I invited her to my birthday party one time. This was, uh, what, my 29th birthday party. I ain't gonna tell y'all I am now, damn, we didn't know it. <laughs> So I invited her to my birthday party. It was intimate. It was like 12 people max because I knew I needed to create a space where it was like safe because I can't bring around 50 patterns because this, be, <laughs> this is going to be like, I'm leaving. You know what I mean? So I had to make it a vibe. And she came and she just hung out. She had some mutual friends there, which was also on purpose so that she could feel comfortable. And then after that, we kind of hit it off and we went on a couple dates. And then that just, you know, progressed into our relationship. And it, that, that's all it was. It wasn't nothing... Yeah. See, what, what, what fellas fail to realize now, just going up and saying, hey, what's up, love? How you doing? What's your name? That can also be... Yeah, that can you work. Know, you know what they do now? They yeah, see well, a you girl. got a damn Prada outfit on, it works. <laughs> <laughs> that shit don't work for a motherfucker. And, your, and your birthday party's at Nobu Malibu? That's, that's, <laughs> that's the difference. Hey, and, you, and you call it a party with... 12 of y'all. <laughs> it was just, you know, the strategy of having mutual friends in yeah. the comfort zone. That wasn't, that this, wasn't this a party. No. That's a setup. This ain't <laughs> normal. That's what it was. Hey, me. Hey, yeah. me. And it's, it's funny because right after she was like, you set me up good here. Like, this was on purpose. I was like, indeed it was. Hey, happy yeah. birthday to me. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, finish up. Give, give the young boy some game. No, I think like, well, fellas need to understand that now, do to see a girl out. And don't say nothing and then hit him on the gram, on DM, and be like, hey, you looked great last night, blah, blah. What if you would have walked up to her and said, hey, how you doing? My name is Victor. It's so nice to meet you. I couldn't help but notice you across the room. And I'm wondering if I could just have this dance with you or if we can just go talk in a quiet corner. Like, is that's cool. You know what I'm saying? It's literally that simple. And the girl be like, oh my God, what corner? That one? Like, <laughs> uh, like they'll be in a minute, in a minute. But dudes get scary and don't. They don't have that, that in-person social connectivity anymore because everything's so based on these phones, you know? Yeah, yeah. Let me see, Seth. You, you, that was some good game, too. <laughs> when I was single, I've been married now for double-digit years. Mm -hmm. You always just go hang by the bathroom. Everybody got to creepy. Everybody got to pee. It's a little creepy. But everybody got to pee. This is true. So you just did with your drinking out. hand? Just... Just chill. I'm not talking about right next to the bathroom like an attendant. <laughs> but you know, down the hallway a little bit, chilling on the wall. Then you see her go in and now she's shuffling in, but now she's relieved. Little endorphins are running because she just relieved herself. She comes out happy, ready to dance, and you the first thing she see. Hey, how you doing, Ray? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> that's a little something for y'all too. I just this boy crazy. If that's he, he's always been that hey, way. you call the cops on people like that. <laughs> people, people like that. Not when you look like me, though. Oh Lord. Have <laughs> she, she asked to see your dance in person. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Walk in the room doing Maybe. it. Yeah. With a towel on. With a towel on. <laughs> this guy, like, I'm ready. First time. I'm ready. <laughs> hey, man. It's the big game week, and the number one seeds made it. Philly, KC. It's time for everything for all the marbles. And so is DraftKings, and it's still the same old sweet deal. Any new customer signing up with the promo code PIVOT, you bet at least $5 on the big game, and you get $200 in additional bets. And now being the big game, you know what these teams are? Consistent. And I'm going to stay with my consistency <laughs> of the same game parlay. The NFC done had a little run now in the big game, but I'm telling the AFC's taking it this year. Same game parlays. Bet multiple bets on the same game and have a chance of winning even more money. 
Hey, and Chan, even though it's the big game, nothing really changes on my side. RC mentioned the promo code pivot. No, you guys go pivot from the sports book to daily fantasy. They got both because the sports book not everywhere. Just use the promo code pivot and get that money. RC will tell you the rest. Absolutely. Get out your devices. Freddie T showed you his. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Any $5 bet on any of these games. Wait, it's actually only one game because it's the big week and you get $200 in additional bets. That's DraftKings Sportsbook app. But seriously, uh, you talked about relationships and we had a couple guys on here. Uh, we talked about golf earlier too. Okay. We had uh, Earl and O, Eastside Golf on here. Uh, how'd you guys come to, you know, uh, know each other? How's that relationship? So we got introduced to a great uh, friend and family friend of mine, uh, Pekos, Sean Pekos Costner. Um, and he introduced us. He was like, yo, these are some young black brothers trying to, trying to change the game of golf. And we met in L.A., had dinner, and um, I just got to hear their story. And, and I was just like, man, this is incredible. And that was like, I had just started getting into golf around that time. It's around 2020. It was during the pandemic. And I just started getting into golf, and I was like, man, these guys are... They speak my language, they look like me, they dress like me. Like, I'm trying to, like, how did they crack the code? I want to help them crack this code together, whatever way possible. And, uh, and from that moment forward, um, we just became friends. We started to hit it all. I started to see them in different circles, started to see them ascend and grow in their brand. And then to the point where I've, I've now invested in, that, in their brand and things like that. And just want to see them continue to grow and do great things. I mean, they're absolutely, also on top of that, they're actually like, the thing about them is that they, yes, they're pushing golf forward. Yes, they're the voice of like young black golfers everywhere or young golfers, period. Um, but they actually can play. Like these dudes yeah. are actually good. Like, right. you know what I mean? So they, not only are they talking to talk, but they can walk it too. They can go on this golf course and teach you a couple things. So that, that was the connectivity factor for me is not only are they, you know, talking to talk and wanting to transcend the game, but they can also go out there and show you too. You mentioned investing in post-career, obviously we get an opportunity to see your face. When you do communicate in the way that you do, you have the great career you have and you're in New York, you get these media opportunities. You mentioned investing in East Side Golf. When you think about continuing to move post-career, what are some of your goals there? Definitely continue to invest in things that make sense, not only for myself, but things that can affect my community. I really want to give back to Patterson, starting with uh, I'm opening a Crystal's a Burgers in, in Patterson. I'm doing five locations, but I told them we got to start in Patterson. Like, I can't open any other of those locations up without starting Patterson first. So, but that's going to bring jobs, that's going to bring infrastructure, that's going to bring opportunities into zones in Patterson that need to be changed and uplifted. Um, so I, th that's one of the things I really want to start into. And then just making the right investments and, and, and continuing through the philanthropy efforts. And I have a foundation geared towards STEM education and now STEAM, if you add arts in there as well. And we're connecting with a high school in Patterson that just, it just named them a, a STEAM high school. So the entire high school is based around STEAM. And we came right in and was like, look, we have programming already set up for this. We've already been doing this for years. Let us implement our programming to certain aspects of this school. That way we can, because we started at the Boys and Girls Club. You know, you lose the kids after they get 12, 13, they get to high school, you start to lose them. So how do we get an influx of those kids still staying in the Boys and Girls Club, but also can now funnel them into a STEAM program in high school to continue that same level of thinking that they had at that after school program? And it was, it's a no brainer. How do you navigate being, and we, we deal with this as well, we talked about it before, with anybody that wants to invest, with anybody that has an idea, you're a one-stop shop. You could be the face of something, you could be the voice of something, and you're the bank. Mm. So like, like when you said Crystal, like I, I, my first thought was like, why Crystal? Yeah. But I don't know if somebody pitched that to you, but how do you navigate knowing that you got the money, you got the attention, you got the face, you got the name? Very good looking dude. I'll give everybody their credit Thank when you. we're on my level. Appreciate that. And <laughs> I, you know, yeah. hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll talk to you on the Zoom yeah, meeting. Yeah, yeah. Off, yeah. Off, off, <laughs> on the Zoom meeting? Tuesdays at nine, you're not invited. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, really, how do, you, how do you navigate knowing that it's easy to be taken advantage of when you're in a situation you're in? Yeah, so I think it's about having a good circle around me. So uh, there's never an opportunity that comes across my plate that I don't vet out to somebody else. Um, whether that's my lawyer, whether that's my financial advisor, I just need eyes on this by people that have seen these contracts before numerous times and that are in my corner. 
um, and that I trust that I've been with for an extended amount of years. So I don't do anything without that. And then also like a little bit of, I mean, again, we're entrepreneurs, right, at this point. So a little bit is trusting your gut, like reading the market, being kind of adept to what's going on in certain fields and certain things that you see out there in the world and ha trusting that gut feeling to say, oh, okay, this makes sense. Or being like, eh, I don't know about that one. So it's basically having that balance of the two as I navigate this space, which is new for me too, man. So I just, you know, I like to vet it through as many people as I can before I pull the trigger. You mentioned uh, earlier <clears throat> winning the Super Bowl, being able to go back to Patterson. And then you mentioned making sure they open the first franchise of Crystals back in Patterson. How special are those kids there? And how much do they motivate you to just, you know, be that example for them? You know, because you've gone through some stuff. You've had your highs, then lows. You know, you're, Ch Channing said, the face of everything. Like, you are something that I'm sure they would love to emulate and want to be like, you have an amazing story. How important is it for you to make sure you continue to make them proud? It's extremely important for me. I mean, everything I do, I have them in mind. You know what I mean? I, everything that I curate or try to put together, I always think first, okay, how can I get the kids involved? Or how can, like, this past holiday season, I took the kids to Nike Town, Foot Locker, gave them $200, go have fun, go. And it's funny, because a lot of them are like, Ma, what's your size? Oh, what you, what, what you want, the white one or the black one? Like, they're getting things for their parents, and they're getting things for everybody else. And that just humbles me to the core that these kids from my city, not only are they thinking about other people, but they're selfless. And like, and I want to help them. I want to continue to help them and continue to put them in positions to win. Because I remember when I was young, like, I didn't have a lot of people coming back to me. And, you know, we had Tim Thomas. He was a guy that yeah. came back to home. And, and But, you know, we saw he was busy playing. Like, we had to... You know, there was nobody coming back on a consistent basis to really talk to us and be like, yo, this is how you do it. You need to have time management when you get to college. Your mother ain't gonna be there. You know what I mean? They'll get you up for school. Like, these are things that I wish somebody else told me outside of my mom, because my mom is, you know, after a while it becomes the same old talk. So I wanted someone that's been there, that's done it, to come back and be like, yo, this is how it's done. So now that I have kind of that torch a little bit, I gotta, I wanna make sure it stays ablaze. And then when it goes to the next person, it's even brighter, it's even bigger. And now that, that responsibility for him or her is even greater and hopefully he's strong enough to carry it too. You know, I want to ask you, kids that are growing up there, they're mostly Giants or Jets fans? And, and which were you or neither? Uh, mostly Giants fans there. Um, but man, I'm gonna be honest, my dad had me a Cowboy fan as a, as a, as a kid. Oh man. wow, yeah. that's a whole loop. Yeah, ah. as a kid, wow. I'm just being honest. But then obviously, uh, but those were the whole Emmett Smith, you, you know, the right. 90s, like they were right. very formative. I got it, I understood. <laughs> um, but then like, it didn't, once I got to my senior year of high school and I saw Michael Strahan mm -hmm. and I saw LT on the sideline and I'm seeing these guys and I'm seeing how the Giants organization carries themselves, obviously from watching the Cowboys play them for years. And I'm like, man, I'm more, I'm much more like these guys than I am like the Cowboys. Like I'm not as flashy and like all of that. But I love the way these guys just go to work every day. They had the elbow pads on and all of that. Like, it felt like a lunch pail type, bring your lunch pail to work every day type organization. And then right when I got to college and then 07 happened, Helmet catch David Tyree and I was like, oh, it's done. I'm out of here. Yeah. Well, Vic, I don't, I don't know now, Vic. Like uh -oh. you, um, I'm looking at, at Vic now, you know, Met Gala Vic, uh, Bermuda Beach Beauty Vic, uh, you know. White Castle Vic, that, that Vic, that Vic wears, Crystal, Crystal I'm sorry, Crystal, Crystal my right. bad. We don't right. talk about that I other said again. hamburger company. Crystal Vic. Okay. We don't talk about that other Not White company. Castle, Crystal oh. Vic. Be, be smart. I got to be smart here. Chain, you know, six chain Vic. You know, that, that, that Vic seemed more Dallas to me. That, that, He's that, Dallas post-career. Yeah, that, that Vic seemed a little... Well, this is it's, it's still Patterson. <laughs> I think that's but, what this but honestly, man, you know, just kind of to get to a little football, mm -hmm. you look at the, the NFC East, Philly, obviously a monster. The New York Giants, Saquon and Daniel kind of putting their stamp saying, yeah, we can be linchpins of this organization. And then Dallas doing again, I guess what Stephen A <laughs> always says, man, what will go wrong goes wrong. How do you see the NFC East now compared to when you were there and the Giants war team that could give you two Super Bowls within five years. 
I love the NFC East right now. I think it's back to that. I mean, we, it's been a while. It's been about 10 years since the entire NFC East has been that formative again, but I'm excited. I'm excited for the future of the NFC East specifically. I'm excited for the future of the Giants specifically. I think we have a great foundation to build off of, a great coaching staff and management team to kind of propel this team to the next level. Um, and I'm excited for all of it. I wish Jalen Hurts played in another division or, <laughs> or just a different place or right. just somewhere else. <laughs> um, but but he's going to, you know, you can see yourself going into battle with that guy twice yeah, a year 100%. for the next 10, 15 years, you know? So we got to buckle up and get ready for that as a Giants fan. Um, but but I'm excited to see where the NFC East is. We got some decisions to make with our quarterback, with our running back. Yeah. We got to go get some damn receivers, man. We need some people to catch some football <laughs> from this guy. I love our receivers, but we had three practice squad guys out there trying to catch passes. Like, and kudos to Dan, that showed more about Daniel Jones right. than it is about the receiving core. I think Daniel Jones raised their level of play, and I think that's what got himself ultimately will get himself paid in this offseason. But, but I love the NFC East, man. I love where it's going, and I love how competitive it is. So basically, what you're saying is this group of wide receivers could never be on a boat with Trey Songz. <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't make it. They wouldn't have made the trip, RC, okay? They wouldn't have made the trip. We had to win and get to the playoffs and be happy, and then we was on the joint, man. <laughs> we ain't never going to live that down. The curse is broken, by the way. If the curse is broken, I'm we made it back to the playoffs, okay? Golly. You didn't, you didn't text the boys like, hey, man, we got a boat for y'all down, down on the water. They wouldn't have took it. I wouldn't have gave it to them. I'd be a bad person, dude. I'd be a bad person to make them realize, well, hey, Trey Song said the boat is ready. <laughs> they would have been like, bro, click. They would have hung up on it. Like, not I got a question about the boat. Did y'all know y'all were getting on the boat? No, the boat happened. It was after. We was just going to Miami. Like, we won. It was New Year's Day. We wanted to go hang out. We drive back up from Philly. We get on a charter. We take the plane to Miami. We get there. We go directly to live. Um, and we're having a blast. Everybody's there. I'm like, I didn't even think, I didn't know what to think really, but I didn't think everyone would be there. Justin Bieber, Young Jeezy, Jamie Foxx, like all the who's who's were there. Trey songs, obviously. So after we're done, we finish up at 11, obviously, because that's naturally where everyone finishes up. We're at 11, it's daylight, we come outside. They're like, yo, Trey got the boat. We're gonna go hang out and get on the boat. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> we should probably just head back. It's already, why y'all wanna go on the boat? It's 7 a.m., like, what are we doing? <laughs> They're like, we want to go on the boat. Like, All right, I can't. I'm just watch y'all. I can't just go to the boat. We're having a great time. Take a picture on the front of the boat, <laughs> right? We all congregate in front of the boat, take a picture, thinking that, like, these guys know not to post. <laughs> post later. Like, not in the moment. Like, don't post right now. <laughs> they post right now. So by the time, we don't even see it. We're having a blast. Boom, boom. We get off the boat. We get back to the uh, to like the office space to get back on the plane and go home, and everybody's knocked out. Everybody's asleep. All you hear, <laughs> everybody's. I'm like, I'm like, yo. And I look at my phone. I take my phone out. A litany of text messages. Yo, y'all on the boat? Y'all just won? What's going on? Why y'all out there? But I'm like, why are we out there? Where is it? I go to Twitter. It's everywhere. I go to Instagram. It's everywhere. <laughs> my email sent me a photo. I'm just like, what is happening, bro? We didn't do anything wrong. That, that explains a lot. But who who posted it? It was one of Trey's friends. One of his, and you know, they're scouring it, and he tagged all of us. Right, so right, we right. all in the tags. So we were definitely out there. Like the picture. That, that explains took the off. Tim leaving from eleven, going directly to the boat at that time of day. I know it well. That explains the Tims and the jeans. We were out. Ain't nobody getting no flip flops. <laughs> we didn't have to. I had a beanie on. <laughs> I can't even wear a red beanie to this day. My boys are like, yo, you know you can't wear that red beanie, right? That like, time. Same one from the boat. You gotta take it off. You gotta it's take it off. I'm like, yeah, I can't even wear a red scully anymore, dog. This is bad. This is bad. Duh, that, you know, you think about that. You, you have that moment, Super Bowl moments, all of these different things. And it does lead you to now uh, being on TV. You've done whether it's entertainment, sports, and you could always tell just in watching you, it was going to be bigger for you than just sports. What's next for you in that arena and where can we kind of anticipate Victor Cruz's career going? That's a great question. So still staying in all those um, entrepreneurial pockets, right? The businesses and things like that. But from a TV space, I still want to host. Um, I was going through CBS and, and trying to get on the talk for a while. I was auditioning for that. 
Um, and as well as acting. Like, I definitely still want to take my talents over to acting and see where that, where that goes. Prior to the pandemic, I was on a show called Pop of the Morning on E! News. And in the same, literally week, I had gotten a gig on Broadway to be in To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, to play Tom Robinson in To Kill a Mockingbird. And it was the most insane experience. I go to a couple acting classes. I tell my agent, like, look, um, I'm going to take some acting classes, but just like football, like, let me get some practice under my belt before you give me an audition. I get like maybe three meetings with my, with my coach, my acting coach. He calls me like, yo, I got you an audition. I'm like, man, stop playing. I'm not, I don't think I'm ready yet. He was like, no, just go out there, put your best foot forward, see what happens, and, uh, and, and we'll live with the results. You learn from it or you might get this thing. And I was like, all right. So I studied my butt off, watched them. I got the movie on while I'm going over the lines so I could get the inflection and see my own, how I'm going to apply my own self into it. I got to get this Southern drawl so they could get that. And I go into the audition, I sit down, I'm already dressed like a little homely so I can kind of give, put them in the, so I can get in the scene, you know what I'm saying? And it worked because as soon as I walked in, the director goes, oh, I see what you're doing and I like it. And I was like, got him. And then I sit down and I just do it, man. I knock it out one time. They asked me to do it again and project a little bit louder. And I did it again. And they kind of all kind of murmured between themselves. And it was like, all right, we're gonna, if you could just step outside and, uh, you know, we're going to congregate for a minute and we'll have someone walk you out. I'm outside like, man, if I can get this thing, they can just tell me, I know how to leave. Like, I don't <laughs> got to stay here. Five minutes later, they come outside, man, and it was like, we think you resonate with this character. We think you understand this character and we want to give you the role. And I was like, huh, what? Right. <laughs> me? You sure? Like, I did that good? Because I didn't even, my first audition ever. I didn't even know if it was good or not. You know what I mean? But, you know, luckily that something good came from that. And, um, but the pandemic obviously slowed down the whole theater thing. But I'm still in it. I'm still uh, auditioning, still doing different things. And that'll pick back up outside. Once, once I become a golf professional, uh, <laughs> I'll get back into that. And, and looking back, though, you know, having gotten kicked out of college twice, uh, could you tell College Vic that, look, man, you're going to f*** this up. Look where we are now. Did you ever think that football can get you this far? Never. Uh, I, 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 never did I think it would. I think if I could tell College Vic to just settle down, dog, mm -hmm. just chill. Like, college is fun, but you're going to have more fun later, I promise. Like, just mm -hmm. chill. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I would tell him. Just, just get through the motions, understand what you have to do to get through this phase, and then, uh, and then get to the other side, and you're going to love it here. You know what I mean? Because the opportunities, the experiences, you know, going to Barbados on a whim and playing golf and just having fun and bringing my daughter on family trips to different places, having her golf now six years, like just having that opportunity um, is, is incredible. And birthday party entrapment, setups, <laughs> public interests, mystery women, all, which, which is in the future? More public interests or mystery women or are the mystery women already public interest that you paid off the photographer not to say <laughs> it was a public interest? I think it's one of those things where, you know, all those entrepreneurial pillars, <laughs> we're going to keep moving. They just shift. <laughs> they just shift. We're just going to keep moving in every lane. We're just going to keep moving them forward, baby. That's, That's all. Love. Big That's man, love. Uh, you know, Freddie T asked this question often. The show is called The Pivot. We actually just hit a year, so it's really cool to have you here, you know, after we were able to show people what we've done the first year. What would you say your biggest pivot was? The thing that you had to accept, adjust, and move forward from? Oh man, I think the biggest pivot for me was, was from becoming a boy to a man. Like, from becoming that kid that was dependent on his parents, that had to like reach out to mom for advice, and, and I still do, but reaching out from a, at a different perspective. And then, you know, when those two men of the house passed away and I was propelled to be the man, that was the biggest pivot for me. That's when everything changed. That's when I focused up on school. That's when I graduated with a 3.0 GPA. That's when I started to turn things around and being like, these people are dependent on me and still are. And I have to be able to get come through for them because if I don't, there's nobody else behind me that will. I don't know if you know, but throughout my career, they call me Fragile Fred. I like, it, I proved it totally wrong. So I kind of get the last laugh. In 2014 and 15, you hit your lowest point in your career. Uh, how did that adversity strengthen your cloth, your fabric, to make you, you know, more mentally tough and stronger? How, how did that shape you? Yeah, it, it shaped me a ton. I mean, you get a lot of time to think with your leg in that sling, sitting up at the crib, you know, foot on the ottoman, 
you get a lot of time to really process your life and kind of shape what you want to do in the future. And I really took advantage of that time to say, okay, football might not be working out right now, but I can still do other things. I can still be beneficial to this world in other areas, and especially other areas that I want to be in. So I would co-host on Good Morning America. I would co-host on the Today Show. I would co-host here. I would co-host everywhere I could. Hosted a show on MTV, one of those, uh, you know, road rules type shows. Yeah, challenge like, type yeah the challenge. Yeah, the challenge. So like, I'm just in it. Like, I'm, I'm not afraid to put myself out there in areas that I feel like I can excel. That may be new for me, but I feel like I can come in here and do something. Um, so I always had those moments within that. And then once I got healthy enough to get back on the field, no matter what the duration of my time was, I wanted to prove that I can get back. And then whatever, you know, transpired after that, I had a nice foundation to, to land on once I was done playing football. You know, I think in the end, you mentioned Patterson and giving back and being a part of community. On this show, that's what we try to do. That's why it was very important to sit down with you because it's about the journey, but also the wisdom gained through that journey. You'll get to talk to some of the kids in Patterson, maybe not all, but you won't get to talk to everyone, whether it's adults. And so for our viewers, man, if there is any life advice that you've learned through going through your adversity, but coming out on the other side, what would it be you share with people about? Well, I think the biggest thing is that understand there's going to be ups and downs, man. There's going to be things that aren't going to go your way to the point where things may feel bleak. Like there were moments in my life where I felt like, do I need to redirect? Do I need to reshift the focus and do something else and just completely hard turn into a different career or something? But I stuck with it. And I think having that stick-to-itiveness really brought me through the other side. And I think there's always going to be ups and downs. It's going to feel like, you know, it's over or it's not able to be attained. But I promise you, if you keep your head down and you stay focused on your task, good things will come from that and you'll come through the other side for sure. Yeah, man, I know um, you get asked to salsa. We are not going. I'm going to make me dance No, nah, we're, we're not going to ask okay. that. But no, I will say this. do that to you. <laughs> What are you doing, man? <laughs> That's a jump rope. I think. Mean, you put it like this. You got yeah, to put it like this. He has 17 hips. knee surgeries. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah but in, in, in honesty, man, everybody has a salsa. Everybody has a celebration. The things that make the salsa or the celebration great is the hard times. Because now you know what it is to be on the opposite side of that. I mean, so it's so good to see you on the opposite side of adversities, to see you on the opposite side of, of injuries and being counted out truly because that's what it feels like, man. So we're so grateful to have you. Thank you for dropping wisdom. Channing now has a new way to set up Asia when he gets home and, yeah. and maybe get lucky at a, a 12 person party. But appreciate you though. Shoot all the Blue Jays you want. If you can hear them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they would not let you into Killer Hockey Bird. They would not let you. Thank you, my boy. That was excellent, dog. Appreciate you. That was great, man. That was dope, dog. Always, always. That was dope. Hold up. Limitless. Take a semi-cap pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a semi cap pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the